In part one of sharding, we learned about what sharding was. And in this part, we're going to actually be looking at some of the, the more particular information. As we can see here, this is kind of what sharding looks like, what, what we're going to be doing. We're going to learn a little bit more particular information. And we're going to go over just a few basic concerns initially about sharding. So there's a kind of a difference in the world of databases and the back end as to how developers think versus how DBAs think. So developers, this is not true with all developers. Some developers can think a little bit outside of this, but sometimes what we'll get into a situation is with some developers, they often misunderstand their environment and they look to inappropriate solutions when facing issues. And the reason why I call these inappropriate solutions um, with some developers is they fail to account for debugging or maintenance. And there's good reasons for that. For instance, developers generally are not responsible for what database administrators are responsible for. So for instance, database administrators, let's say with SQL Server, are going to be responsible for an operation like re-indexing, whereas developers are not going to be. So a developer might actually look at indexing a whole bunch of columns that are unnecessary, thinking that it's going to speed everything up without realizing that, okay, there's nothing wrong with indexing a column, but there's a cost associated with that. And so that's one of the reasons why there can be uh, sometimes a miscommunication. And the other thing too about developers is that the, they don't always look at, and we're talking about some developers again, at how much time is going to be involved in debugging or handling errors. This really comes to life when we're dealing with clients. So in, I believe I discussed briefly, in the world of Agile, which is a very popular approach um, to managing IT, uh, projects managing development projects one thing that we that I see in common with a lot of agile developers is the misunderstanding that even though they can change things as it goes you cannot change the client's expectation as it goes clients are just not that um, mutable if you would and if you set their expectations that it's going to be fairly quickly and it's not fairly quickly clients tend to get very irritated so my observation, again, in just kind of various testing, is that while Agile may work very effectively in the development world, and it may be something that a lot of developers enjoy, clients don't necessarily have that perspective of Agile. And in fact, in comparing developers' views to clients' views of Agile, it's very interesting to me that clients tend to have a, tend to have a slightly more negative opinion of it than developers do. And part of that may be that it from a client perspective seems unreliable, right? Well, the reason for that is because of debugging and handling errors, okay? Everything in a perfect world gets rolled out perfectly, but it's not a perfect world. And usually, I believe it was Jeff Atwood who said that the average developer spends two thirds of his or her time on debugging errors. That's just, you develop a solution, but you're gonna spend two thirds of your time and uh, you can do the calculation. So when it comes to sharding, it could be a very useful solution, right? That being said, there are going to be some costs. That is not a bad thing. That may be very useful, um, but we have to consider those costs. So we know that we can shard on a per collection basis, okay? And one of the things that we want to keep, keep here, to keep in mind here is that when we do shard, we are going to shard by a key. And the shard key essentially is basically the indexed field um, in a collection that we're going to be um, sharding by. It must exist, absolutely must exist in every single document um, in the collection that we're discussing, okay? So again, if we're gonna, let me go back to this example here. If we're going to, let's suppose that we have a collection here that's 600 gig, okay? And we'll call this collection A. And we're, we have documents that have some fields, some of the documents don't have those fields, but let's say we have a field, um, uh, let me think about how to make this pretty straightforward. Let's say we have a field called uh, zip code, okay? And that zip code field exists in every single document, okay? And that is the only field other than the ID field that exists in every document, okay? So from a sharding perspective, we only have a couple of options. We can either shard from the, the object ID, okay? That's gonna be an indexed field, or by default, by the way, object ID is indexed, or we can shard from the zip code provided that it's indexed 
And again, we know that it's in every single um, collection. We could not shard from, let's say, hypothetically, we had, um, since we're, I guess we're dealing with addresses here, home address. Some, some fields don't have home address. How do you break that up in shards? So for instance, again, we have the 600 gig collection. How would we be able to break it up into 200 gig if some of the documents in the collection don't have that field? It's not possible, right? So it happens, of course, on a per collection basis. We have the 600 gig collection. We're sharding on that per collection basis. We must make sure that the field that we're going to shard on is an indexed field. For instance, we in our example, we have the zip code or we have the object ID. Those are both going to be indexed fields. And then, of course, we have to make sure that whatever field we're sharding by exists in every single document within that collection. And so this covers part two, and in part three, we'll continue going into what is sharding and where it's useful.